All of you gardeners, we're so glad that you have joined us on Mid-American Gardener. So gardeners everywhere, if you've got questions, we are going to be ready for your questions. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. And my areas are cut flowers and perennials. And so if you have those kind of questions, I might, I might chime in on those. But I do have three very talented, intelligent people, no pressure. And I'm going to introduce the, each one of them and they'll probably do a show and tell or maybe answer an email. Let's start first with you, Ella Maxwell. Hi, I work at Hair Nursery in Peoria and I can answer most garden related questions. And today my show and share are these beautiful daffodils out of my garden. I do have some heavy deer present presents and so the daffodils I think are something that um, does real well. Nothing really bothers them and uh, there's a lot of diversity that you can find. Of course these are fall planted bulbs but um, there's uh, some that have large cups like your regular Dutch Master and then what some people would refer to as a jonquil has a little uh, short cup and uh, there's some little dwarf ones, jet fire, teate, even some that have this split and open corona. So they're, they're just beautiful. My yard is ablaze with daffodils. Uh, show that pinkish one on the back side. I can see it from my oh, view. That's you really, think this one? There's even I, a darker one. Oh, this one right okay. Here. I think that's uh, Salome. Yes, I'm not uh -huh. sure. Could but um, uh, I do have the names written down somewhere. And I really <laughs> enjoy them. And, um, you know, they, you, you don't even have to dig up and divide them. They just keep going. And when you do have deer presents, they are the best plant. And they live forever, hundreds of years. They okay, really... well, I'm not sure I'll get there, but. You will, <laughs> or your daffodils will. That's it, my daffodils. <laughs> Thank you, Ella, very much. And now we're gonna throw it over to you, Dave. Dave Plusard in the middle. Hi, I'm a certified arborist. And so my specialty would be trees, shrubs, landscaping. So any questions like that, I'll be glad to answer for you. What I wanted to start with is some of the plants that are flowering in the landscape right now. And I know that we have a pretty wide distribution of uh, viewers around here. So it'll be a little bit different in Peoria. We're a little bit uh, farther behind than you are in this area. But this is magnolia and it is flowering now. It's a flowering tree. Which kind of magnolia? This is a saucer magnolia. So it has the tulip shaped with the pink uh, on the petals there. So that makes it rather beautiful little plant and they are gorgeous. Diane said they're really gorgeous on the uh, campus right now in the University of Illinois, but even around your town, I'm sure you'd find them beautiful. This is the uh, Judd Viburnum and it is flowering just beginning in, in my yard and just getting started. Actually, the blossoms are usually a little bit bigger than this. And, and then- it's, it's fragrant. Oh, it is very fragrant, oh, yes. it's wonderful. Mm -hmm, very sweet smell. This is my peach tree, loaded with buds this year. And uh, a couple flowers even starting to open. So you can see those. And so that's really what exciting. What kind of peach did you say it was? This is Reliance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then this is a lilac and it's pretty uh, far along with its leaves and with its bud. And one of the reasons I'm mentioning these is that this is an early season. We're at least two weeks ahead than mm -hmm. we normally are. And consequently, people often ask, well, what if the weather actually turns cold? And I'm not sure how quickly we're going to be having some cold weather, but if it would actually drop down to freezing temperatures, it would get down below freezing, What's gonna to happen to my plan is what people will ask. Most of them are going to be just fine. There will possibly be damage to some of them. Most of the things that would be in flower, if anybody's had a peach tree, you know that we often lose our peaches for that reason, a late uh, early blossoms and a late cold weather. But uh, the tree itself should be fine. The same with the magnolia, the same with the viburnum and the lilacs as well. Now, some of the more tender ones like lilacs, sometimes you're gonna end up with some blackening of the leaves and sometimes even on your trees, things like that will happen. Sometimes you may lose even all the foliage, but generally most of the plants around here are gonna send out new growth. So just be patient. It's not really that unusual to happen. So if we do have uh, a real cold spell after this nice warm weather we've had, your plants are going to be fine. 
very reassuring because it is early. It is. Two right. weeks I had noticed. And if you know that it's going to be cold, cut some of those, bring them inside, enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And you certainly can cover if it's not going to be an extended period. I know. I've had star <clears throat> magnolias that it, they got a really heavy frost and they lasted two days or mm -hmm. 16 hours. It seemed really <laughs> short. And this year the star magnolias have been in flower two full weeks. Nice. And I'm hoping, of course, with rains that shortens anything from there. So thank you for your tree discussion. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. Now let's go to you, Karen Ruckel. Hi, I also work at Hair Nursery in Peoria and uh, perennials, shrubs, uh, a little bit of a house plant. And what I wanted to talk about is spirea. I would say there's a vast majority, maybe probably 75% of everybody has a spirea in your landscape. And now in this springtime is a great time to, to really dress up those plants. If you find that you're fighting with them, that they're kind of overgrowing the sidewalk or grabbing your guests as they come in through the <laughs> summer months, and you're having to do a lot of work during the summer on them, you can switch all that around, do work now, and have better looking plants, and, and then and they won't be falling over the sidewalk or being too big in the landscape. The spireas a lot of time will get bigger than the labels say, and so really at this time, if you've done nothing with your spirea and some of your stems are very big and old like this one, I would say at this point, cut off all your stems, half of them. And if you're pressed for time, I wouldn't even worry about doing it neatly. Just maybe get out some head shears and, and chop it back. This plant grows very quickly and will hide all those ugly stems. Now, if you want to take the time, you can always go to a stem and see where a new little growth bud is coming halfway down the plant and cut right above that growth. And then it will look tidier and it won't be as ragged looking. I probably cut back my spirea almost to the ground, two to three inches every other year and so I've got very tender very young growth on it and then I'm not really having to do much pruning or any anything to it during the summer now during the summer if we have a very heavy uh, bloom time yeah maybe a light shearing would tidy that up but right now perfect time go out there take half the plant off uh, next year maybe you could go a little bit more vigorously or take out some older stems too very good. Good advice because sometimes people are worried about things when they're cutting them in half. Well, so. and they get too big. Yeah, they do. And the old flowers on there, I think, don't always look the greatest. So just cut them back. All right. Thank you very much. We are going to do a special <coughs> Did You Know video next. The total length of roots and root hairs of a single rye plant is 7,000 miles. The roots grow over three miles per day in search of microorganisms. All right, let's go to the phone lines next, and we're going to go to Rod's question on line two, and it's about tomatoes. Hi, Rod. Hi there. I got two quick questions. I've heard calcium is good for uh, preventing diseases of tomato plants. What form do you think is best, and can you use too much? My second question is I read a blog where a gentleman grew a tomato plant in straight compost. It was a volunteer grew on his compost pile. And he said it was the best tomatoes he ever grown. Is that <laughs> a good idea or a bad idea? Okay, let's start with the calcium. Uh, what form for tomatoes and can you overdo it? Well, the important thing to understand about calcium is that it helps to make stronger cell walls. And the calcium is most important for uh, a problem called blossom end rot when the uh, tomatoes begin to develop, and that can also be a result of uh, a watering issue, either mm -hmm. too much water or not enough back and forth. So I don't think it does a lot for disease problems, especially to the leaf, the leaf disease problems, and that's where you want to plant late and mulch. And then the other question, sure, you could grow them in straight compost, I but would what, think. He was asking what form of calcium would you? Well, I, I think, um, I, I'm not sure. Don't you use Epsom salts, or is that not calcium? You can use lime, would provide yeah. some calcium, uh, as long as you don't want to alter your pH too much. Yeah. Um, the, if you have blossom end rot problem, you certainly have the sprays that you can use to help mm -hmm. prevent that yeah. problem from occurring, and then more <laughs> consistent watering. 
Um, Which the mulching it's not, makes. Normally in our area, Central Illinois, calcium is not something you need to add. So I really wouldn't be doing it unless you had a soil test done. Okay. And then the straight compost, boy, that I had some of the best watermelons ever. I didn't even know the seeds were there. I, I had that with <laughs> pumpkins, so mm -hmm. I'd give it a try, sure. And uh, cantaloupe, too, one time. Mm -hmm. So yes, compost piles do great things and they, you don't even know it's happening. Oh, we shouldn't say that. That doesn't sound very professional. <laughs> yes, that's what we plan for. All right, let's go to Richard's <laughs> questions on line three. And he has a tree question. Hi, Richard. Hello, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I don't know whether anybody can help me or not, but I've got a small tree that has grown up volunteer last year. Looks like it might be a fruit tree. I'm going to transplant it, but the problem is about uh, it's about big as your thumb and it's about four foot high, but about a foot and a half up, it is bent. And I'm wondering if I should put a stake next to that and tape it real sternly, or just take tape and kind of straighten it out and wrap it or something. I just wonder if you had any other ideas. How bent is it? Pardon? How bent is it? How bad is the bend? It, it's bent fairly good. I mean, it's like it started to grow a branch out, kind of like, you know, in fact, part of it might have broke off on the other side. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, keep in mind that normally fruit trees, we don't worry about what the shape and the look is. We're more growing them for their function, and that is to give us good fruit. So I wouldn't worry about making sure that it was a, a beautiful straight plant. However, when you go to, after you dig it up, and then you go to plant it, you can kind of straighten it up. And actually, I have seen trees with a, a good crook in them, and when they're planted and as the time grows, mm -hmm. it almost looks like they're straightening up. Well, they're really not, but the way that the wood develops on the trunk, mm -hmm. uh, eventually that crook almost disappears. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about that. I would just make sure you get it transplanted and then you get your good fruit developing. So he would take probably a bit of a soil ball with mm -hmm. it. Although trees can be bare root, but they I, can be. You know, you have your choice of bare root. If things go badly, you just say, "I wanted to bare root it," and then. But you can take a soil ball mm -hmm. and move it as well. Okay, very good. Thank you, Richard. Let's go to Peggy's question on line five, and it's about evergreens. Hi, Peggy. Hi. What's your question? Um, my question is, um, I've, I'm replacing two blue spruce that we cut down last year. And I need to know two really lovely, lovely evergreens. I, I'm thinking about um, a Norway spruce, um, something that would be really good in this area, though. How much room do you have? Norways are huge. Okay. Well, I've got, I, I've got a lot of room now, but, but now I'm seeing 50 feet tall. Is that correct? Can be. Okay. Norways can be taller. Th that's yeah. right. If you, if you are over 50, though, you won't have to worry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I want to throw I want to throw in a Black Hill spruce as a possibility. They're slow growing, very dense. They are very nice. Black a con Hill? color fir is oh, gorgeous as well. Oh, I love con well. color that, firs. That'd be the first one I'd plant. Would be a con color fir. I love them, but they can be they can be big as well. And um, a, another type of white spruce would work as well. Black Hills happens to be a white spruce, so either that or the Black Hills or the white spruce would be a good choice. And a Douglas fir is also a very nice oh, tree. Yes. And a hemlock is a nice tree. So there's many good choices. But not a bl another blue spruce, I would say, because they have a lot of disease issues. Very good, thank you, Peggy. We loved your question, <laughs> it's fun. Now let's go to Arnold's question about rabbit resistant plants on line four. Hi, Arnold. Hi, um, yeah, I was wondering about what are some good plants that you can recommend that, that rabbits don't eat because <laughs> a lot of our plants are just being eaten right now. Mm -hmm. Well, not daffodils. Um, yes, da oh, they daffodils. Can, daffodils would be great to plant because they are, they aren't I mean, eaten by rabbits. They're not eaten they're by. Not. That's yeah, what yeah, I meant. Yeah, right. Daffodils yeah. are not eaten. I didn't quite finish but my you're, sentence. But you're talking about landscape shrubs around your home, I'm sure, and uh, there are a number of different plants that you can choose. And if you wanted an evergreen, uh, boxwoods are mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. good in that respect, in that they won't be browsed by deer or rabbits. Sometimes, though. 
you know, the plant, you might just need a physical barrier to keep the rabbits away. Now the spirea will always grow out of any damage that the rabbits might eat. So that would solve our pruning question already. <laughs> and um, I do think that... Uh, I well, I think, don't, uh, aren't scented things that have, you know, scented geraniums and rosemary, do, well, do rabbits eat herbs? I don't know, that I, I've I never had trouble so. with it. But, but I think he's really looking for more uh, shrubs. Okay. But, but there's lots of perennials, and you can just uh, look. There's lists about rabbit-resistant plants, same way with deer-resistant. Mm -hmm. And usually it is the winter time that the rabbits create the problem, and uh, you could put your barrier around them. You could use a repellent to uh, put around the plants and prevent it, but a lot of times it's just the winter, and you do not have trouble with them during the regular season. Get a dog. <laughs> you are full of them tonight. Mm -hmm. It, it, it would work. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for that question. Let's go back round two and maybe do some emails or if you have more show and tells. Ella, you first. Oh, I do. I have a, uh, a viewer from uh, Valparaiso. Her daughter got a plant last spring, and it's going to be in the first picture. It had red trumpet-like blooms. It's a mandevilla vine, and uh, the flower, it doesn't normally flower indoors during the winter, and you can see that the little vines were trailing. She wanted to know how large was it going to get. Well, it's in that hanging basket, and does she need to grow it on a trellis? Probably not. The other pictures that she added were of uh, begonias, and if you really want something that will give you flowers over the winter, and hers have, are these angel wing uh, begonias, and they've, they've done real well for her. So she has this mandevilla, don't expect blooms. You can put it outside for the summer. It just usually vines because of the low light conditions. You okay. could cut those off. It has kind of a milky sap. Okay, very good. And Dave. All right, mine is a seasonal tips question, and this is from JT in Bloomington. When is the best time to mulch, fall or spring? And actually, um, I don't know if there really is absolutely the best time to mulch. I would do it when you are ready, and this time of the year, which is going into the spring, I would get it down before the weeds start growing. That's absolutely the best time. If you're putting it down in the fall, it's depending on what you're putting it down on. Is it a new garden? And you may want to put it down uh, around your fruit trees, like your peaches, after the ground is frozen. But otherwise, you certainly can be doing your mulching most any time of the year. Uh, can you transplant tulips now? Well, tulips usually are only going to be transplanted when they're dormant, so you want to wait until after the foliage has turned yellow, and then you're going to dig them up. You can store them and then plant them in the ground in the fall. If you don't get around to it until fall, certainly can dig them up and move it, but definitely don't want to be doing it uh, while there is nice green foliage and flowers on them. And the final part of the question is, uh, what should I put in my bare ground in my small garden over the winter time? And generally, uh, if you want to use some kind of a, a crop over the winter time, you can use daikon radishes, which can be tilled in afterwards. You could do buckwheat, you could do some other form of wheat. But if you want some sort of crop there that you then till in later, any of those that are kind of annual grow fast, and then you're going to till them in before spring gets here, gets time to plant. Okay, very good. And next to you, Karen. I've got a question uh, from Brenda about a sour cherry tree. And she, about three years ago, started noticing that the, the cherry trees would lose their, their leaves every year. A branch went bare last summer, the other yellowing leaves. But both of the trees last year produced really good. Well, this is not a good sign for your tree. The, the cherries, first off, get a lot of foliar fungal diseases, and our, our cool springs and wet springs would certainly add to that. So without the leaves from last year, we wouldn't be able to know, is it a foliar fungal disease? So look for spots this spring on those leaves. I'm more suspectful that, that the tree might have borers. So look lower on the trunk, look for holes, look for sap oozing out. And that could be the indication that unfortunately your tree, which cherries are very susceptible to various bores, that, that your tree is starting to go out. So I would start looking maybe, you know, at those signs. If there's definitely holes and bore damage on your trunk, 
I would be looking at the beautiful fruit trees that are in the garden centers right now and uh, looking at a replacement to put nearby to, to start getting that going for you. That's a good suggestion. Nicely said too, to kind of break the blow. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, we do have several questions I've noticed about voles coming up. So let's go to Pat's question on line three about voles. Hi there. Hey, thanks for taking my question. You're welcome. I have um, what I've looked online to realize tracks in the lawn that are these long kind of serpentine. They're not underneath the lawn. They're kind of through it. Mm -hmm. And I'm told by the Internet anyway that they're voles that are um, chewing up my lawn. I'm trying to figure out what I should do about that. They are horrible because I have them in my yard and sometimes I'm about ready to give up. They've eaten so many of my perennials, but in the lawn they actually are not something to worry about because that those little trails are going to disappear and you won't notice them anymore. However, just to make sure that you don't get the problem that I have is they get very prolific. I would recommend that you probably do some sort of trapping. You can do uh, something like mouse traps because really they're very closely related to mice. Also, you could, uh, this is, came from Ella, is take a, a jar like a mason jar, take the lid off, cut kind of a triangle in it, put in a block of uh, rabbit poison, or not rabbit poison, um, mouse, mouse bait. poison, mouse bait, screw it on, and then that little triangle, they will come in and they will eat it, and then that will kill them, but not get it any sort of animal that you really don't want to target. So that would be a good way to control them as well. Yeah, because you're, get... you're taking the metal lid that you would have on a canning jar and yes. the screw on there, so it's pretty safe yes. and, and, and sturdy. And something has to be small to get yes. in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's about that time of year when we get vol questions. So I think I, I might have gotten two questions answered by doing the one. Thank you for that. Let's go to Dave's question about rose bushes on line five. Hi, Dave. Good evening. Yes, Thanks what's your question? Uh, I got three rose bushes here in front of my south facing living room window. And about a year ago at the end of February, I had contacted at one of our local landscaping guys to come through and trim them for me and he came but he waited till like the second month second week in March or so and before he got here and then I was in the other room and I heard heard a buzzing noise outside of my window I came out here and he was trimming them with hit with some cordless hair, hedge clippers which from watching your show I understand is not a good thing and this year they're there, I see no new growth on them at all, and all the other rose bushes around here have started to come out with red leaves. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if maybe these are kiss goodbye and we we'll have to put some use in or something. Well, I wouldn't have done it in March. I would have waited. It would depend on the variety, really, as to what yeah. type. If they're, yeah, uh, I, I think they'll still come out. I think you're you're going to be yeah. okay. Well, and, and what was done last year, I don't think that would have no, indicated, would, you know, the I winter would, ability and what happened this year. Yeah, I would give them time. It's probably a little bit early uh, yet, even even though some have already started to come out. Just give them a chance before you decide that they're uh, they're no good. And, and it may have nothing to do with the trimming, too. Right. It could have been the winter or something like that. And, and look down low on the plant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you do see it's coming down low, go ahead and trim back what's not leafing out to tidy them up in, in a couple weeks from now. But I would wait until April. I would not do them that early. That's and tomorrow. I would wait until <laughs> later than tomorrow to oh, do see, them. Oh, see, I wouldn't. I would oh, really? I oh, I always it. wait. Except if one is like eight feet tall, I hit okay, it back before What that. Diane and I are talking about, though, are for like knockout roses could really be trimmed about any time. But if you're really a rosarian with hybrid teas mm -hmm. or some of the grafted roses, then you certainly would want to wait. But these new knockouts or some of the other shrub roses, I believe they could be trimmed just like the spirea as soon as you see new growth. So it has and, a lot to do with the type of rose they and are. And we found out in milder years, those knockouts are getting a lot taller than advertised. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, five so foot you tall. might need to head them eight. back. Oh my goodness. And just eight foot tall. because they are so mm -hmm. big. Okay, well let's go to our mag quiz video next.
What does deadheading flowers do? A. Annoys hungry bees. B. Encourages further blooming. C. Stimulates root growth. D. Stunts growth. B. Encourages further blooming. Okay, well, there are so many things to do in spring. It is really a great time of year, so we're glad for all of your calls because you've had some great calls. Thank you three for being here. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise, and uh, really there's a lot to talk about. We did it from evergreens to all kinds of perennials, so it's a great time of year. Thank you so much for watching. We hope that you have a great week gardening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.